I am Jeff Foxworthy and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Okay, everybody, once again, here we are, West Point, Mississippi, home of Mossy Oak brand, Camo, the Gamekeeper Studio. Deadly it is. The place where it all happens. It's hot outside. Yeah. Well, today's going to be really interesting. We're missing a couple folks. Toxie wanted to be here. Something came up. Uh, Lanny he was all is, dressed up looking. So Yeah, he had a, a meeting he had to go to. Lanny's doing some gamekeeping, so he's out. Uh, Mac is sitting over here to fact check us, keep us on track with everything. We've got Richie running the board over here, and I'm not sure what Richie's he's running paying something. attention, but yeah, yeah, there he is. I know he's there when I hear that. So, looking across the table on the guest couch, we've got Dr. Bronson Strickland from Mississippi State University. Hey guys, good to see you again, as always. Mm -hmm. He makes his way over here frequently. Yeah, we had a good lunch. We did. Yeah, uh, it, it's always around noon, too, when I come over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He's got it figured out. Yeah. So, and then as a guest via the magic of the internet, we've got Dr. Dwayne Elmore from Oklahoma State University, the Extension Service, and he's uh, he's there now, but he'll soon be at if we can go ahead and tell him, tell me if I can do this, uh, Dr. Elmore, but he's going to be uh, at the Tall Timbers Quail Research Facility very soon. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. Good to see you all again. Good Glad. to see Bronson again. Yeah, as always. Glad to have you back. Thank you. Well, uh, Dwayne. Should I call you Dwayne or D Wayne? What would oh, you? Oh, oh, Dwayne's good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I bet he's heard that one before a few we've, times. We have had uh, we enjoyed having you on last time, and you're obviously a really smart guy. We appreciate all the research you guys are doing and the education. And what we want to try to do, I'm going to set the table, and then I'm going to hit pause. We got a couple things we got to take care of, but what we want to do with this one, there's something that kind of happens in the Bronson, I'm looking at you. It's a, kind of a, a, a can be a summertime, spring, summertime problem. Guys that are trying to feed corn, uh, there's a something called aflatoxin. If I'm Al, a, you got it right. Yeah, I got I'm it right. so used to you calling it the wrong name that I I still corrected you. So what we want to, you know, guys are going to feed corn. Right? They're just there's mm -hmm. this it's, 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 we want to teach people what's going on and how they can do it in the safest way. Mm -hmm. And and along the way, they may learn some things. I, Dr. Elmore's got some some ideas, but this is uh, this is some some pretty serious gamekeeper uh, suggestions and advice. And uh, I think guys will learn something from all this. So, Bronson, you're shaking your head, but we're on the radio, so you need to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you visual cues, Bobby, yeah. that I'm I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So y'all hold on just one second. So there's a couple of things, Mac. What is going on at mossyoak.com this week? So one one cool thing that I saw that they had was archery drills to replace real hunting scenarios. And I thought, I mean, shoot, it's almost time to start worrying about practicing shooting your bow. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. And then another thing that I know is up Dudley's Alley is foraging for chanterelles. Oh, yeah. So two really cool articles. They're really, the Mossy Oak website really does have cool articles. Uh, foraging for chanterelles, I mean, just... All kinds of gamekeeping stuff. You very, just go to the Mossy Oak page, and it's just right there. It's very seasonally relevant, yeah. and I, and they're doing they're they're doing a better job every month. So at least once a week, guys, you ought to go just check out mossyoak.com. And it's always new stuff too, which is what I think is really cool. And then another thing I want to make sure we we touch on uh, there's a a young man, Brady Connor, had a house fire, lost every lost all his camo. What, what can you tell me about that, uh, Mac? Yeah, so Brady's from Wisconsin, and I've been I've talked to Brady for a couple years about seed and his food plots and, and working with that, and he's also pro staff for Mossy Oak. And uh, he sent us a really cool video about a, a tractor that he got re- 
he reapplied some old bottom land and some gamekeeper stickers and it looked really cool and I shared it to everybody and I asked him to send me a video and he was like well it might take me a few days we actually had a fire last Monday and then he said I'm getting married in 10 days from when the fire was or something around those lines so he's actually getting married this weekend so so um, he didn't tell you you had to ask yeah I, I asked Man. and uh and we're, I mean, he lost every bit of clothing. I mean, everything. Thankfully, he said the wedding dress was uh, at his in-law's house. But, I mean, the clothes they're wearing are from the insurance company and same thing with hygiene items and stuff like that. So we're definitely going to send him some camo. But uh, they've got, his brother actually started him a GoFundMe. And you can find it uh, if you search through GoFundMe at Brady Connor House Fire. And I mean, anything will help. I mean, we're going to try to do everything we can to help him out. He's a great guy. And yeah, man. Gamekeeper. That's that's a tough way to start off a new marriage. Yeah. Wow. 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 Yeah. Fire, so guys, y'all y'all check that out. Go find me. The guy's name is Brady Connor. C O N N E R. Ugh. Well. Okay. Well, Brady, we're thinking about you, and uh, boy, we, we, let's try to help. Let's do. Let's try to do all we can to help. So, all right, we got that knocked out. There was. Uh, I look, I owe there's a there's a young guy that uh listens to our podcast. I think he subscribes to the mag the whole nine yards that won the U the not the US there's this guy Brian Harmon won the open. And he Mac, you're a golfer. You you it's that's that's a big tournament. Absolutely. And and I think every, I mean a lot of folks have probably heard about it, but I mean the biggest thing was the response of what are, what are you going to do now? <laughs> yeah, he's talking about a tractor and everything. Well, I kind of owe him an apology. We what right after that happened, we announced it that hey man, congratulations on a podcast. And then that one got cut. It didn't make the it, it we had some audio issues. It got cut. Yeah, thank you, Richie. So, then we did another podcast. And we mentioned him again, Bronson, and congratulated him on winning uh, the, the the Open. That one had some audio issues as well. It got cut. So it, this is my third attempt, <laughs> and I'm going to take blame for everything. But, look, uh, Brian, we're just super proud of you, everybody at Mossy Oak, everybody, game, gamekeepers, and we, we, we are just proud of the way you represented uh, – folks from the south yeah and uh and hunters yeah and uh yeah we were just real impressed and uh but so we, we just want to say congratulations Congrats. we noticed and we we were cheering for you and uh he's got a brother scott who's also real involved in hunting and game keeping and stuff so yeah that's good so mac looking back at you who is this episode brought to you by so yeah so this episode is brought by cell helmet visit cellhelmet.com I mean, it's super cool. I, you've got a case. I think yeah. a lot of folks around here have got a case. It's the best phone case I ever had, and I'm not just saying that. I, I mean, you definitely are rough on your phone, so if you say that, then it's got to be a good one. Well, look, it, it's super durable, and it's got the Gamekeeper logo on there. It's bottom lane with Gamekeeper, so you can go to sellhelmet.com uh, backslash Mossy Oak, and you can find this thing. It's a, it's really nice. And I, the, co the cool thing is, is, as I know a lot of folks don't get – too high up in the tree anymore and you know keep it under 15 feet so if you drop your phone it's up to 13 foot drop certification so if you're wow. sitting in your stand drop your phone it's going to be taken care of <laughs> i've dropped mine a bunch i hadn't been that high off the ground but it has it has worked my phone is still in one piece we need to get you once uh bronson i'll take it yeah you need we need to get yeah you lay it on me all right, guys, so you can go to sellhelmet.com and check out, look for the Mossy Oak cell uh, cases, and especially look for the Gamekeeper cell cases. So, uh, Mac, thank you. Uh, uh, Dudley, as we get started, we've talked about moving the rapid fire to the beginning to get to know Dwayne a little bit better. Are you ready for that? <laughs> I'm going to take that as a no or a maybe. <laughs> I've got like eight of them right now. That's plenty. I'm ready. That's plenty. I'm ready. Uh -huh. So rapid fire, Dwayne. You remember it from you remember it from last time. We, I it, do. It's yeah. uh, we ask you some questions. It's brought to you by our friends at Springfield Armory. We make some great pistols, and it's just a chance for us to get to know you a little bit better. And we we need to move this to the beginning instead of the end, uh, I anyway. So here we go. Are we ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's be quick now. Okay. Eggs fried or scrambled? Scrambled. Cornbread or roll? 
Cornbread. Sausage biscuit with jelly or without? With and strawberry only. Okay. Well, not great. So hunting Bob Whites or hunting all those other Western quail like scale quail? Take a Ooh, pick. Uh, uh, Bob White. I have to go with Bob White. All right. Dove hunt. Early season or late season? Late. There you go. The big doves. Okra. Slimy or fried? Fried. Yellow squash or zucchini? Zucchini. Texas barbecue or Memphis? <laughs> Memphis. Kansas City or Carolina? Carolina. Last but not least, Dwayne the Rock Johnson or Dwayne Dog the Bounty Hunter? Rock Johnson. All right. No doubt. You know, Rock Johnson is a big bass fisherman. Yeah, he's a big outdoorsman, but really likes bass fishing. Yeah. He's got some ponds. Remember Sean that was here from the American Sport Fish? Yeah. Manager? He, he, sport Fish. American sport fish. He, uh, I think he's recently met him and they, and he was just real impressed with Rock's knowledge of bass. And yeah, bass I think management. he's really into intensively manage, managing them, catching big old bass. Mm. All right, so. Dwayne, we're looking at you. Okay. We're going, we want to come out of the gate. We got Bronson here to help us understand this, but this aflatoxin. Let's talk about what it is and what how it gets started and how it can impact the wildlife we love so much. Yep. So it's produced by various species of fungus that are in the genus Aspergillus. So they're, they occur all over the globe. There's different types of Aspergillus. There's two in particular that often produce this toxin. It's a secondary compound, and they usually produce it when they're under stress. So for those that are listening to this that maybe are in crop production, you probably know about this already because you're used to hearing about hot corn. Often when corn is drought stressed during the summer, there's a lot of concern about whether or not it's going to be able to be sold uh, for, for commodity. Well, when, when people are talking about hot corn, that's really what they're talking about is this aflatoxin that is produced by this specific type of fungus. And just so everybody knows, it's everywhere. You're breathing it right now. It's all in the environment. So we can't avoid the fungus, but we can minimize the aflatoxin that's produced by it. Wow. So it's like a cumulative effect. You're, you're breathing it all the time or whatever, but uh, once it gets to certain, of course, we're not eating aflatoxin corn. That's more well, in feed corn, right? That's right. So you're breathing the spores. The spores are floating around and they're looking for a suitable place to grow, which they need carbohydrates, sugars. So if they land on uh, a, a grain stock like corn or sorghum or rice, then they can start to produce um, the, the fun, fungus. And, and, and over time, those toxins can, can, can accumulate on that grain. And even when the fungus is dead, if it perishes, the toxins remain. And they're, they're really stable for a long time, which has important implications for stored grain that you might be feeding to wildlife. So is there some weather patterns that are more concerning than others? Is it if there's a lot of moisture, it does, does that contribute to having more of this aflatoxin? Yeah, so uh, Bronson um, and Mississippi State, they've, they've done some work on this relevant to that question, and we have as well. So. I'll chime in first, and then I'm sure Bronson can add to this. But typically, this fungus grows well in warm, moist uh, environments. So, uh, you know, if you're talking about temperatures in the 80s, it, it can get too hot. But typically, you know, the 80s and 90s, the fungus grows very well, especially when there's high humidity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be wet from actual rain, but just humidity in the atmosphere. and those of us in the south know that that's most of the year that you know or at least big chunk of it uh, is potentially of a susceptible time that aflatoxin can be produced because aspergillus is flourishing during those environmental conditions bobby i know the other day you brought some corn over that that we had grown and set it on the table in there and it still had the husks and the the corn had more or less dried down but just the 
I guess the humidity in the air and the husk still being on it, when you would peel the husk back, several of them had become moldy. Yeah. Yeah, um, I saw that. I don't know if that was aspergil- aspergillus or not, but uh, it was pretty alarming. So, Bronson, as a as a guy here in Mississippi trying to advise people, um, do you see a lot of problems during like the that November to January deer season? When are you when are you most concerned about this? Yeah, we we did an, an experiment uh, a couple years ago now, and so we looked at uh, aflatoxin production first of all in the corn that you buy in the bag corn, in the feeders that you put it in. And then on corn piles on the ground. And the, the first thing we found out, and Dwayne, you may have seen this too, is that years ago, I think a study done in Georgia and Texas, before there was any regulation whatsoever of livestock or human and then wildlife corn, was there was uh, anything that would not pass the test that you could go to livestock with you could just relegate it as wildlife. So it was untested, unregulated whatsoever. Now, back 20 plus years ago, they found just in the bag, these really high levels, toxic levels from the beginning. But what we found, and I think we went over four different states, Mississippi and surrounding states bought 20 something different brands. And we found out that the levels in the bag were either non-existent or really, really low, oh, that's non-dangerous good. levels. So that has been a victory. But the, the qualifier there is that they were tested. So, you know, you got to make sure there's some regulatory measures in there that it was tested. So then the next step is, okay, let's go put it in a feeder and what happens. And what we found during the, the fall was that we found it in a few feeders, but not in a majority of them and the levels were really low. Then we're trying to simulate if you're putting it on the ground, either pouring it out of a bag or out of a spinner or something like that. And we measured it from day one to, and I think we did every other day out into 10 days. And to like what Dwayne was saying earlier, the temperature and moisture that those two things interacting is really, really important. We found that in November during the hunting season, we never got levels that were high enough to negatively impact birds or deer. And, and keep in mind, birds are far more susceptible to the toxicosis than mammals are, especially deer. But then we turned right around and said, okay, now what if people are doing this in the springtime? Would you really be doing that for deer nutrition? Probably not. You might be doing it to keep some birds on your property for example birds being turkeys birds primarily being turkeys yeah, yeah. okay go ahead and we found uh it was really alarming is that in 100 percent of the corn piles the simulated bait stations that they all recorded a significant increase from five to seven to eight to ten days increase in aflatoxins and the amount that, it, that we got was like three, four, five times the amount that would kill or cause serious harm to a turkey. And so, Dwayne, double check me on this, but I think it, it's measured in parts per billion. That's correct. Yeah. To, to harm a bird, and we're talking about uh, death or liver damage or just really, really hurt the bird physiologically one way or the other is about 200 parts per billion. For mammals and like deer, it's 800 parts per billion. We were getting levels that were over 2,000 parts per billion, but only in the springtime. We never recorded that in the fall, but in the springtime, and that is when higher temperatures, higher moisture. Mm. So that's just what Dwayne was, was addressing earlier about the conditions. The, the aflatoxin is, is very, very common and prevalent, but it's all about the levels that are consumed is what's going to damage or harm the animal. So yeah, that's it, a really important point. It's the dosage is what you need to be concerned about is how much the animal is actually ingesting. So you guys and, and Dwayne, I, I know Bronson has explained this to me. I want to see kind of what your thoughts on this too as, as well. But y'all are talking about if, if a guy's going to feed, 
and and I'm, there's a lot of people that enjoy I'm one of them I'll be honest with you I love running a feeder but I want to learn how to the best way to do it I want to be, be safe about this but you, you guys have told me that you don't want corn to lay on the ground more than a day mm-hmm. is that the window a day or is it was it two days I can't remember now I, I would say more like three you want yeah. it three or less because in the the feeders that that I've run or, or and running it, it whatever spin cycle goes off for eight or ten seconds that's gone in a few hours right it's i mean it's not staying there more than 12 hours i i just know it isn't Mm -hmm. so i feel like that's kind of being somewhat uh, i mean that's a much better scenario but what i'm learning now is about this spring and these temperatures being up a guy probably needs to look at feeding something else in during that time period or not at all. Or not or, at all. Or not uh, at all. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Well, and the reason I say something else, I, Dwayne, don't you have an idea of something else a guy could feed that's not as susceptible? Yeah, there there is variation between different uh, types of carb, carbohydrates, different types of sugars, and how quickly um, aspergillus flourishes and subsequently the aflatoxin. And we didn't test everything by any stretch, but we did test corn versus grain sorghum. Milo and Milo definitely accumulated aflatoxin at a much slower pace. So if you were feeding grain sorghum, you're going to have a little bit more of a buffer in terms of time. Uh, it took a, it took a couple more days uh, under the same environmental conditions to reach those really alarming aflatoxin levels as opposed to corn. So that's one potential strategy. Uh, side note, Bronson and I were talking about this earlier. It was interesting that in that study, we also documented uh, almost zero raccoon use of the grain sorghum feeders, while the deer use was uh, the same. We saw no difference in deer activity between corn and sorghum, but a lot less non-target. Now, that's going to vary from place to place. Probably a lot of that has to do with familiar, how familiar the animals are with that grain type, you know, they can get accustomed to it over time, but just know that changing grain type is one option and it may potentially reduce how much you actually have to feed because you might not have as much non-target use. So that's one mitigation strategy in addition to what Bronson has already mentioned, trying to avoid those uh, high risk environmental conditions of higher temperature and higher relative humidity. But I remember when that when that report uh, publication that Dwayne's referring to, I've seen it a number of times, and that's kind of become uh, a recommendation, is that if, if raccoons are just wearing you out, like if you're doing a camera survey, that consider switching to Milo as an alternative. And one thing to make sure the audience understands, you know, we've talked about how this aflatoxin is dangerous to, to, to animals, um, and Bronson hit on a couple of these I just want to make sure that everybody knows like how this affects an animal. There's there's various ways depending on the dosage the animal's getting. Uh, but some of the things we know about aflatoxin, it's a carcinogenic. I mean, it causes cancer, including humans. Um, it's one listed as a major carcinogenic in parts of the developing world where they don't rigorously test grains that are being fed to humans. It causes liver impairment, which has all kinds of whole body problems from immunity to reproduction capacity, et cetera. So it's really hard on the liver and it can be both acute liver damage or chronic. So we we talk about these alarming high levels of aflatoxin that might, that potentially if it was high enough, that just could outright kill an animal from one instance. But probably the more realistic scenario that's happening on the landscape is just chronic low levels accumulated over time where an animal is constantly being, uh, you know, being affected by this, this toxin that can have long-term health consequences. Now I want to make it clear. We do not know of any population level effects that's going on. We don't know uh, of any deer populations that are being negatively impacted at the population level. We don't know of any Turkey populations that have declined because of aflatoxins. So we're not trying to be alarmist about this, just realistic that it is a known toxin that has serious uh, health effects to lots of animals if the dosage is high enough. You know, well, I wouldn't want to test that out on my place. I know that. (laughs) 
So, yep. I mean, yep. it just hasn't really been studied yet. Is that correct? At the population level, that At is the correct. Population and, that level. and that would be a hard thing to test. That would be a very difficult study. But there's been a lot of lab work where animals have been subjected to it. And we know full well at certain dosages what happens to animals, and it's not good. In fact, how we found out about this thing was in the 60s. And people may have heard about disease X in turkeys, where entire poultry barns were, were decimated by some unknown pathogen. Well, it turned out it was aflatoxin in the grain that was being fed to these domestic turkeys. So that's how this became known to the world that, hey, this is a serious thing, and we need to be careful about the grain we're feeding to to birds in particular. I think it's smart to be aware of this. And uh, it, look, I applaud you guys for bringing it, bringing it to the forefront so that people can make educated decisions about the way they do things. Yeah. And so uh, Bronson, I'm, you, you mentioned um, pouring feed on the ground. You mentioned feeders and then you, you said feeder and then you said spin feeder. So that first feeder you were talking to, was that, were you thinking like a trough feeder? Yeah. Was yeah. That, it, was uh, that what uh, you were meaning? I'm just trying to make sure I understand that. Yeah. Anywhere where there would be an accumulation of moisture and typically with a trough, you're filling it up and it's going to last for days and days and days. Right. Versus something like a spinner, it's usually, like you alluded to at your place, it's going to be gone in a couple hours or at most a couple days. So is the corn inside that spinner, it, if it's kept dry, is it safe? Um, you are certainly creating conditions that would minimize the growth of the aflatoxin by doing that. Yes. Yeah. Because we tested all sorts of types of feeders and we just rarely found it in there and then that kind of became part of our best management practices for if you're going to do it once a year certainly every other year clean the feeder from top to bottom yeah that's a good idea hey Dwayne, if, if a guy walks up on he, he's some corn that's what can he look at it and recognize it will he see that mold and if he finds that what yeah. should he do yeah, that's a great question so if you see mold on grain you don't know necessarily what kind of fungus it is. It could be lots of different uh, types of fungus. However, if it's got fungus on it, that means that grain was exposed to the conditions that would also likely produce aflatoxin. So you might not be physically seeing it, but there's a high chance it's there too. Safe there could to be assume. lots of different fungus. Yeah. Um, but on the flip side, grain can look perfectly fine and be two or three thousand parts per billion aflatoxin which could kill a turkey uh, so you can't look at it and know that it's safe um, the only thing you can do to have some assurance as bronson said earlier is to buy grain that has been tested and that's really important to at least start off with clean grain and then from there you can control the situation so bronson does it does it to, to be sold, and I, I'm going to think you know more about Mississippi than anywhere else. Does it have to be alpha toxin tested? I have I have to admit, I don't know for a fact if it does, but I do know there are options. Yeah. I do know you can request it and look for that on the bag. We've got a guy in a few minutes we're going to call that is a grain, he, he, buy, he buys and bags grain. Mm -hmm. And and we're gonna get him to tell us just what they go through. But Mac, you've got you know this guy. Yeah, no, I do. I'm interested to get Seth and get his opinion as a you know a seed grower, farmer, and as well as a you know grain elevator. But uh, one question I had, Doctor Elmore, uh, is the parts per per billion higher in corn or rice bran? Because I mean, I've always heard of folks feeding rice bran as well. Yeah, so we, we've not tested rice, uh, but I know that rice can grow aspergillus, meaning then that it can become contaminated with aflatoxin. So um, it it's probably going to be just like any other grain that given the right environmental conditions and enough time, you can get to those high toxic levels with rice just like you can with corn. But as I mentioned with the corn versus sorghum, there's a it's on a different trajectory because they're different sugar types. You'd expect there'd probably be some variation between rice bran 
as well as as corn as well but i i don't know if it accumulates faster or slower because we've never tested that and i've never seen that uh published anywhere where anyone else has tested that yes sir that makes sense my my last question is do you test so like say somebody has a 50 acre cornfield they harvest 40 percent of it leave the rest of the field standing will there be alpha toxin aflatoxin in that corn on the stalk there could be um that grain has certainly been exposed to the spores that are blowing in the atmosphere and if the environmental conditions were appropriate then yeah it could accumulate on that grain um and and at that point it would just be how much is uh, what's the level what's the accumulation and how much does an animal consume at any one time? That Those would be the two risk factors for animals that are consuming that standing grain. I'm thinking, though, that being that that's going to be on the stalk largely in the fall and the winter and probably gone by the spring, uh, that, you know, that may be a, a way to say that it's not near as much of a problem as if it was corn directly put on the ground in the right. spring. I was just thinking, yes, if, I mean, if you're growing a, you know, a summer crop of corn, I mean, there's corn with the ears, you know, right now people are cutting corn and in September, oh, like it's the still going to be hot. They, they leave it standing right. so to, to mow it uh, later in the year. It's, it's a good, po- good point. Tech, and, yeah, for sure. And Bronson, I'm, I'm going to look at you here. You know, when I think about the hunting industry, there are a lot of companies that have poor on the ground deer attractants and guys we probably ought to rethink some of that uh and and at the very least make sure we're not putting more down that than an animal consume in that day not just going there that weekend and boring the whole bag out that's not that's not smart knowing now what we know and nobody wants to harm the right the the deer herds Mm -hmm. so so I, I'm just proud of you guys bringing this to uh, our attention and so that we can help be a voice. And so, uh, look, why don't we, uh, Matt, can you get Seth on the phone real quick? And uh, so, Dwayne, I, let this guy set the stage. This guy's a big, uh, he, he bags corn. That, that, uh, if you I mean, making Mississippi, he's got a company called Southern Feed and Seed, and he his product is called Triple Clean. And he, mm-hmm. we've been down there, talked to him. I mean, we're not, there's, there's no money. He's not a sponsor or anything. He just makes a great product. Mm-hmm. Triple clean corn. It's, it, and, and to hear him explain to us the effort he goes through to make sure his corn is alpha toxin free. It, so my hope is, is that people listen to this, wherever you are, Georgia, Texas, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, traveling to North Florida soon, <laughs> is that, 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 Guys will start looking for their their bag if they're going to feed corn. Hey, is this alpha toxin been has it been tested? And no, and not just buy the cheapest thing they can buy. Right. right. So that's what yep. I'm hoping that we can do. While we're getting Seth, Doctor Elmore, I have one more <clears throat> quick question. Yes, sir. If it affects turkeys and birds with that 200 parts per, per billion, what is the quail parts per billion that it's toxic? So, there, um, you don't know Bronson that off the top actually, of your head. I don't, I don't, but, but there is a paper. Bronson and I were just talking about it before we, I'll look that up. Um, that would have been, oh, if uh, I was interviewing you for Tall Timbers, that would have been the first question I probably would have asked. <laughs> well, it, hey, Dwayne, I the exact I, amount up, but Bronson, do you know off the top of your head? You may have I, just I, read it. Yeah, I, I don't remember it being explained at, as what was the threshold of parts per mm-hmm. billion that, that was toxic. But in general, the experiment was there was a control where they fed these wild-caught quail. They The control, so they were fed zero aflatoxin level. And then I think it was 100, 200, 500, and up to 1,000 parts per billion. And in those four groups where they were fed a hundred or more, uh, the, the group that was fed 200 and then 500 and a thousand, they had mortalities. They had deaths. <laughs> wow. And the ones that didn't die, they documented severe physiological, like we were talking about liver problems and so forth. So just based on that, and that was in South Texas, if it was 100 or less, 
they didn't experience any problems. Good, Seth. Hey, Seth. How you doing? Man, I'm good. Look, everybody. This this we've got Seth Cohen. And he's a he's a great guy from Macon, Mississippi. He has a company called Southern Feed and Seed or Southern Seed and Feed. I get it backwards sometimes. But he bags more corn than it than I mean he bags a lot of corn. So Seth, we wanted to uh, Richie, can we hit the horns for him there? Be nice. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay, Richie. So all right. So what well, Seth, we'd like to ask you. We've got two PhD really smart guys on here, and we've been talking about aflatoxin. Could you talk about what you know about it and how you look for it and test test uh, for it and just let us understand how stringent that is? Absolutely. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to y'all, and I hope I don't show my ignorance with um, you guys too much. But, um, you know, we, we have been doing this for a long time, 40 years actually. And so anything I can learn, I'd love to learn today. Um, because, you know, sometimes we do um, need to learn some more about the industry. So feel free to, you know, give me ad- any advice that you can. Um, what Southern Seed and Feed does is when we buy corn, I, I typically know almost every individual that I buy corn from. And that gives me kind of an edge over a lot of people because I get a higher quality than just buying it from a commercial grain elevator. So when we buy corn and then when we receive it, when, you know, prior to the truck getting unloaded, we visually check it. We run an alpha toxin test, a few modicum test, a moisture test, a test weight test. And, um, then, you know, we go ahead and unload it. Then after that, um, once we bag the corn, we basically go through the same steps again and retain that sample that has a date code on it and a lot number. Um, we check for alpha toxin um, and our cutoff level is 20 parts per billion. So that's a little bit in a nutshell what we do. Um, I'm happy to um, expand on that. It's my It's been my understanding that alpha toxin was a mold and that, you know, could, could start small and turn out bigger whether it be in a bin or a feeder or in a bag or in the field. But I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts and and, um, what you have to tell me on the the matter. Thanks for giving us that summary. I appreciate that. And it's really encouraging to hear that, you know, y'all have such a a low level cutoff, 20 parts per billion. And I'll just tell the audience that's that's lower than the USDA requires for grain, um, which is 50 parts per billion. So that's that's excellent. And, and you're absolutely right that aflatoxin does come from a type of fungus. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and that's what we see, too. Um, different years are different. You know, we're coming into corn harvest time now, and certain hybrids are more susceptible to other ones. If the shuck is open and then you get a lot of thunderstorms or hurricane rain, you have a lot bigger chance of having aflatoxin. Um, and so you have to monitor a lot closer um, in those types of years, because what happens is you might buy corn that is 15 parts per billion. Then you turn around and it can actually get more on you down the road, um, in the farmer's bin or whatever. So, um, 99% of our corn, I would say less than 1%, we see an alpha toxin level that is higher than 5% when we test it. But there are cases where you do find it and then we have to, you know, reject those loads. Um, but by and large, we don't struggle with it that much, but it can be a bigger issue on different years. Um, and, and it does seem to me like, um, that possibly we could educate, um, ourselves better along with the deer hunters or whoever's utilizing this corn of how to keep that corn dry. And so it don't continue, um, possibly to get worse um you know if it's a fungus that continues to grow in a moist damp environment you know do we need to clean out the feeders more do we need to keep it in a dry place what can we better educate ourselves um, going forward to avoid any um disappointments yeah you said a mouthful there and now again we uh, seth we've been, we've kind of been talking about some of this stuff with the with uh with Dwayne and, and bronson about 
about what you just said. And I, I think it kind of boils back down to uh, if, a, if a guy's got to – obviously you, get, you need to do everything you can to keep it dry. But, Dwayne, I want to ask you, when you think about – when I think about a, a lot of duck hunters, a lot of duck – big duck properties grow corn and leave corn standing, and then it's standing there on the cob above water, moisture, humidity. Could that potentially out there in that scenario – that corn seemed like it would be susceptible to alpha toxin. It, it is. And there's uh, published reports um, back in the 80s in particular of uh, a, acute toxicity, meaning a- animals outright died, Bur- mallards outright died. But, and it, it was identified as aflatoxicity, aflatoxin toxicity. So, yes, uh, under certain circumstances, it is a problem. Um, you know, it has to do with the fact that waterfowl are very gregarious um, and they'll concentrate on fields. And if that field happened to be full of, quote, hot aflatoxin grain, they are at risk. I wonder if an animal uh, like a duck would be apt to, you know, be able to like smell it and, and tell that it's moldy or something like I'd I'm that, seeing Bron- Bronson shake his head, but I bet a deer could. Oh well, yeah, but deer are a lot smarter than ducks. <laughs> Before I let you go, Seth, on the outside of the bag, you tell people that this has been. It, there's somewhere it says alpha toxin tested. Am I correct? Um, yes, um, and, and different bags say differently, different things. But normally there'll be a place that says, you know. Um, meets the industry standards or something like that. Um, but our, our cutoff for Southern Seed Feed is 20 parts per billion. So you should not receive any product directly from our location that's more than that. Now, bear in mind, and I use this with caution, that it is a fungus that continues to grow. And that's, I would, I would hope that it would never get worse than that in a bag, but we do need to Keep in mind that we need to store this stuff in a good location. And um, to your point about the ducks over corn in a cornfield, you know, if you find the right hybrid that the ear hangs down and it sheds water, my opinion would be, be that you probably would be fine with that. But different hybrids are different. So that's just one little thought I had on that. But, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, um, you know, have any input that y'all have for me with, with the triple clean corn anything we could do better yeah and i think the takeaway with uh from from seth is, is uh wherever you are in this country buying corn you, you you ought to look on that bag and make sure it says it's been tested for aflatoxin and if it doesn't that's, say that anywhere I, I, don't, I don't think you'd trust you ought to trust buying mm-hmm. it so hopefully that's a message that we can communicate so seth look we appreciate you uh, taking time to let us uh, let us call you and appreciate what you do yes sir we appreciate the opportunity to to do this with you all right, man. Take care. Thanks, Seth. All right. Yeah, thank y'all. Hey, guys, if we can, I'll circle back to this, the quail question again. So um, a lot of folks, especially in the part of the world that I'm about to move to, feed quail. Um, and they do it in a very specific way. It's broadcast distributed into cover broadly. It's put out at small amounts, but frequently and they use primarily grain sorghum. And these properties have the highest reported quail densities of anywhere in North America. I mean, we're talking exceptionally high, sometimes, you know, pushing two birds per acre Bob White fall density. So clearly that's working in those areas. And by, it's not necessarily for aflatoxin concerns, but the way that they distribute the grain and the type of grain they use is is basically they're mit, they're self mitigating, so they are spreading the grain out. It's usually consumed within three or four days. They're using a type of grain that doesn't accumulate the af, aflatoxin as quickly anyway, and they're storing it and keeping it dry. So that's an, a real world example of a wildlife management scenario where grain is being fed at broad scales with little to no documented negative impacts to wildlife. So it can be done. So, you know, while this can sound really alarming, uh, I just want to point that out that, you know, with with simple mitigation, 
folks can lower the risk to ex very low and acceptable levels where, the, where, where their chances of harming wildlife is, is, is low. But if you're just willy-nilly buying grain, any grain, untested and not taking care of it and you're dumping it out under warm moist conditions in a big pile you are causing toxic toxicity to wildlife it's just a question of how bad is it yeah that's a, that's a really good point Dwayne when I asked you a few minutes ago about if a guy what what should a guy do if he finds some what did, yeah. did we answer that question I don't think we did. Uh, I, I would destroy it, you know, bag it up and throw it away or bury it, make it inaccessible to, yeah. to wildlife. So yeah. if you I had, wouldn't want to breathe it either while I was collecting it. So yeah. if, if you if you found some that you you poured out, you, you you would need to go back with a shovel and a and a tub or something and just get all that and get it out of there and dispose of it some other kind of way where it can't nothing else can have access to it. Yes, sir. That's right. Hey, Dwayne, in, in the example you gave too, down in South Georgia, North Florida, they're also doing that, I assume, to hopefully improve or maximize overwinter survival. So they're also doing it at a time of year where the odds of the uh, aflatoxin levels growing are pretty low as well. Yeah, that's a great point. It depends on the property. A lot of them, you know, um, do feed, well, most of them feed over the winter, but some of them also feed year round. Mm -hmm. So there are properties where they are feeding year round, but again, uh, the way they're doing it is a real, uh, a much lower risk. And I think, you know, as we've hit on so many times, it's buying clean grain to begin with and not letting it, uh, get wet and not letting it stay in the environment long enough. Because as you said, Bronson, and we saw in our study, uh, even under those really risky environmental conditions like April, May, June, um, if you start out at zero or near, near zero and it's all cleaned up in three or four or five days, it didn't have time to reach those real toxic levels. So even if you're going to feed during the spring and summer, if you're not letting it sit there for very long, your risk is low. You know, and if you have many deer at all, three or four, five days for a, I mean, they're they going to they gonna clean something like that up. But mm -hmm. gosh, you know, I, 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 we think about, Dwayne, we think about how many guys are out there with, with feeders and, and I'm one of them guys, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you. But the thing that, that, the one thing that I keep thinking about is, is well, I got a little mulch feeder and I can set it to go off in the morning for a few seconds at noon for just a few seconds, maybe middle of the afternoon. So instead of throwing out a whole bunch of corn at one time, I've kind of gotten it broken out over, mm -hmm. and and, it's, it, it, you and know, it gets consumed. And it gets consumed right then. I know yeah. it does. And mm -hmm. uh, so, I feel like that. If you're going to do it, that's probably that's the way to do it. Absolutely. You know, the, the pouring it out on the ground though is we're not do, we're not help we're not doing anybody any good, especially right? in the spring and summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or trying to save a buck by buying the cheap moldy grain to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how, well, we, boy, I tell you what, I'd love to learn. I should have, I should have prepared a little bit better and found out if there are, are some regulations about, can you sell corn that, that it is over? Well, you, you hear about folks pulling up to somebody's farm and getting 55 gallon drums filled. I, I don't know how legit that is, but I, I would venture to guess that they aren't testing and you don't really know how long it's been stored or how it's been stored. Right. Because right. there's a reason they couldn't sell it as a commodity. Mm -hmm. So yep. ask questions. That's it. How, uh, how actually do they test for aflatoxins? Do, do either of y'all know? Should I was hoping that. to ask Chris, but uh, <laughs> y'all were all running your mouth. <laughs> Chris, who is Chris? The guy we just had on, what's uh, his name? Seth. 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 I've been calling him Chris since lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. We sent ours off to, la to a lab for testing. I suspect Bronson, they probably you did the same. Probably. We did the state chem lab, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Same here. State lab. I didn't know so if I've they had I've some never device in with... out in-house or how that works. Yeah, how they do it on an agricultural scale, I'm 
I, I don't know Dwayne, but I know for us scientifically, we, we send it to a chemist and they've got an assay that they mm-hmm. run. Yeah. And then I was reading, just going over different studies and I came across something uh, that was saying that you can treat seed with a s- certain type of aspergillus strain that actually almost invades the corn, but it doesn't produce the toxins. Oh, uh, I'm impressed. You've been digging deep in the literature. Yeah. Yeah. So there are different strains of aspergillus and you're exactly right. Some of them are not as prone to produce a, uh, the aflatoxin. So yes, there is a truth in that, that if you could colonize a grain with a strain that is less is less likely to produce that toxin, you could lower the risk. Right. Now on a practical scale, you know, for the hunter or someone buying grain that that really has no practicality, but that is, that is a reality uh, at large scales or, and it certainly can, can influence why fields that are beside each other, even potentially one could be hot and the other not, even if they had the same planting date and were exposed to the same environmental conditions, just by the vagaries of what spores landed on that grain, it could dictate how much aflatoxin ended up accumulating. Interesting stuff. So would that be practical? Unless somebody came up with a really efficient way of applying it, you know, maybe at the elevator when they were dropping it into the bags or something. I, I don't know. Obviously, Oklahoma's not as humid as some other p- parts of the country, I wouldn't think. It's not generally, but, you know, we still have a lot of problems with aflatoxin in certain years. Uh, it's like you know, Seth mentioned a while ago. It varies a lot from year to year, and there's some years where it is a huge issue and producers are kind of stuck with this grain and, you know, don't know what to do with it. Um, and so some years it's all over the press, and in those years I get a lot of calls from from hunters that are worried about it. And and then it kind of dies down and people forget about it for a while. Um, uh, you know, my understanding is, and I wish I thought and asked before he left us, but uh, at the grain uh, mills, if they get a load in, they have a couple of options. If it tests above 50 parts per billion, you know, they can just outright turn it away or they can mix it with existing grain to to basically lower the concentrations down. So if they've got most of their grain is below that threshold um, and, you know, it could be mixed so that they meet the USDA criteria. Uh, at least in Oklahoma, that's my understanding of how that's often dealt with. But the problem is in years where, you know, a lot of the loads are coming in at 100 or 200 or higher, and they just end up having to turn it away. And it's that grain that we really are concerned about. Well, where is it ending up? Who's buying it? <laughs> Maybe they're making fuel out of it or something. We can hope. I think I think Mike just texted Chris. What did you find out when you texted? Yeah, him? so Seth uh, said <laughs> that they run a lab test on this machine, and it prints the results at their site. It takes about ten minutes per load, so you you can imagine. I mean, there's fifteen, you know, eighteen wheeler grain bins lined up waiting on these tests to come. I mean, that's how serious I guess he takes it. Uh, and I mean, it said it takes about 10 minutes for the results and then eight to $10 per test. Not bad. Mm-hmm. Well, well, Bob, I think Bobby had asked, uh, prior, uh, by email about roasting or, or heat treatments that, yes. that that's, that's questioned a lot. Like, well, can we, can we do, uh, treat it with heat? Um, potentially yes. Um, The short answer is aflatoxin is very resistant to heat. Once it's on grain, it's quite stable. It can, it can be there for a long period of time, even under high heat, but under certain temperatures for certain durations, you can degrade aflatoxin and lower. So for example, peanuts that are roasted, that is a good way to drop the aflatoxin concentrations, probably not to zero, but to acceptable levels. And and that's a big concern in parts of the world where there is a lot of aflatoxin and they, they don't have the luxury of just 
dumping the feed, you know, people are starving and they've got to use it. So, you know, sometimes processing or, or heat treatments, roasting can make it more, uh, more, a more safer product. So yeah, heat can partially degrade aflatoxin, but it's not, uh, it's not a, it's not a guarantee. Yeah. That's interesting. Mike, you got another one. Yeah. Are there any native plants that seed and create that alpha alpha toxin uh, yeah i mean um the the fungus is not that specific it'll grow on essentially any any uh anything that's a sugar so you know uh it if you if you did a if you sampled some of the um seeds at food stores in your house or you know like thyme seed in your in your cabinet you could you could probably detect aflatoxin at some level. So it's, it's on lots of different, including native, native seeds. Um, and again, it all comes back to the dosage. You know, if an animal's consuming high quantities of the same food store and it happens to be contaminated, that's where the risk is going to be. Um, generally speaking, if an animal has access to a diversity of, of foods, some of which may be at higher or lower concentrations, that's ri- that's r- basically risk mi- management. I mean, the animal's not doing it for that reason, but uh, having a diversity of, of foods out there, you're going to be less likely that they're going to con- overconsume a, a toxin that's accumulated at a higher rate on on one of them. It almost seems like there's a correlation where you know you see deer and things, uh, you know they'll eat acorns and and things like that, hard mast type things in the fall and winter. Uh, you know, they naturally do that anyway, but in the spring and summer, they move over to more things uh, like, you know, green stuff like plants. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with turkeys, you know, you see them eating more mast and seed heads and things in the fall and winter, and then they transition over to more insects and grasses and and forbs and things like that. So uh, it's, it's almost like it's just part of the natural cycle, you know, and, and the <clears> research <throat> has proven that when you put it out in the spring and summer, you're way more apt to have more concentrations of it than you are in the fall and winter. Just kind of an observation. Mm-hmm. Well, Bronson, you guys have a, like a Mississippi State. Here's our statement on how we think you should handle feeding corn. What Can you kind of right. quote that for us? Yeah, hopefully we'll see how <laughs> my memory is. Uh, yeah, but uh, number one, uh, was it tested? So you're starting with a bag or, or a source that it was tested and it was a very, very low level or not detected. Uh, number two, once a year, clean your feeder. And that just means a solution of, say, a fourth bleach to, to water and just running it and cleaning it out. So again, you're setting it to zero again. And then the last thing is just relative to in the fall and then during the spring. In the fall, it's not as big of a concern, but I think it's still a good management practice. You just don't want that stuff sitting there for so long. Even think of it economically. If corn is going to sit there on the ground as often as it rains in Mississippi, you're probably going to have some spoilage anyways, just wasting it. Uh, and then, but, but if it's going to go out during warmer temperatures, you want it consumed and gone by three days. Yeah, three days. What about, Dwayne, what about Oklahoma State University up there? What are your, your thoughts? It's very, very similar. We have a uh, fact sheet with best management practices, and it basically says use uh, USDA or other or other certification uh, grain that meets that low threshold. So start out with, quote, clean grain, keep it dry, um, minimize how much you put out at any one time. Uh, you know, I think for us, we found four and five days was kind of a threshold. So don't allow it to be sitting on the ground for more than that period of time. And where feasible, spread the grain rather than pile it up. Wow. Mac, have you learned anything? A lot. I still can't pronounce it, but I think I can talk <laughs> about it a little bit better. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. 
Dwayne, we all, we we've come to really like you. You 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 say what's on your mind. You say it where we can understand it, and uh, you make a lot of sense. And you're talking about things we're interested in. And uh, so, well, I am a Mississippi State graduate. Well, there you, know, you go. Yeah, that's what. Just look at everybody in here is excited about that. I, it, it, you know, I'm not a Mississippi State graduate, so. But yeah, we th- th- we've we've noticed. I'm the only one in the room, <laughs> yeah. but. So, look, we always like to ask a trivia question, and your today yes. is no different. Mac, have you got one prepared, and who are we playing for? Yes, I do. So we're going to do a true false today, uh, and it should definitely be in your wheelhouse. So you're playing for F D E P T fifty six, who left us a review. And okay. so this is a true false question. But, but hang on one second. What does it? What does it? Does that mean anything? To me, I would think it would mean fire department. But it's F D D E P fifty six. So I guess I would assume the guy might be a fireman. He that was born be. in fifty six. Yeah, yeah. And um, what is he? What potentially could he win? I really hope you get this one right because he could win a pair of Leopold sunglasses. Oh, man. And it's the last pair we've got. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Is this for me or Bronson? (laughs) (laughs) Or or can can I tag Bronson if I don't know? Yeah, I think you. I don't think you're gonna have any problem. I'm with feeling that. the stress. Uh, yeah, Dwayne, I'll, I'll shoot I'll just, you a text. Yeah, the last few have missed it, so pressure's on. Oh old. goodness! Yeah. All right, true okay. or false? Do wild coveys of quail sleep in a circle with their heads facing out? <laughs> true. There we go. It, you know now, that was the very first trivia question we ever asked on episode now, one. And two people now, listen I, to that one. Yeah, I, I, I almost got all brainy on you and said, well, it depends on the time of you. But the short answer is yes, they they, they usually do that. Isn't that an amazing thing that they mm-hmm. do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that roofing yeah. in that circle like that. Yeah. And, and that- yeah, there's heat conservation uh, is one reason to do that. And the other is uh, if you're attacked in the middle of the night, uh, there's, there's a benefit of being in a group and, flushing all at once you're less likely as an individual to be captured so there's a couple there's a couple of survival reasons to do that wasn't that mark mcconnell that had some uh, like drone. infrared yeah. drone yeah, yeah. yeah. really mm-hmm. interesting stuff have you have you seen that yeah mm-hmm. it really is not we mm-hmm. always say this nature is just so amazing it but is. if you didn't know those little, those little birds are out there roosting in a tight circle helping each other stay warm and watching out it's it's yeah. really I don't know. I love them. Nature's cool. Yeah, it is. Uh, Dwayne, Dr. Dwayne Elmore, you're with right now as we speak. You're with Oklahoma State University Extension Service. But uh, when the people listen to this, you'll probably be in North Florida, South Georgia, working for Tall Timbers. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, we've been here in Oklahoma for 17 and a half years. It's been wonderful. Loved OSU every minute of it. But um, we are looking forward to uh, moving back in the southeast. Well, we're we're gonna looking forward to having you. But be sure we'll, we'll stay in touch with you for sure. Make sure we get Absolutely. your uh, email address when you. When you I get will. Moved. Thank y'all for having me. No, oh, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And uh, I know that F Department Fifty Six appreciates mm-hmm. that quick yeah. win right there. Yeah. I'm glad I didn't fail them. Yeah, he'll <laughs> get in touch with us. We'll get those glasses sent. Bronson, we always enjoy having you over here. Yes, sir. Always enjoy it myself. We, you're like a tax deduction. We're feeding you so much now. <laughs> uh, we well, probably owe you. more than a lot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, have, have y'all done a, uh, a, a, a MSU Deer Lab podcast lately? Uh, we did one. Gosh, I think it was about two weeks ago. But we really delved into the topic of buck breeding value and making that relative to selective harvest and culling. So just another one of those metrics uh, that people make assumptions. In other words, what that means is, if you got a big old trophy buck, what do his offspring look like in terms of their antler size? Oh, wow. And so that that's kind of what the buck breeding value is all about. So we talked with uh, Dr. Randy DeYoung. He's down at Texas A&M University, Kingsville, and He's an expert in that. He's also an alumnus of the MSU Deer Lab, and um, I think he has been a part of one of the best studies ever done on that topic. And so we we dug pretty deep on that. So, yeah, that was the most recent one. Well, you guys always have something interesting going on. For well, thank sure. you. Thank yep. you. Yep. 
Wow, I'm looking, Mac. You look like you're fresh out of questions, which is I don't know that I've ever seen you. Like that. <laughs> no, I still got some questions. <laughs> what should we be doing right now, Bronson? Getting ready for food plot season and hunting season coming up. What What should a gamekeeper be doing on his on his farm? I would be uh, number one, where the food plot's going. Number two, I would be getting fields prepped uh, in terms of getting soil tests. If you haven't had uh, the soil tests in a while, I would be going ahead and locating seed and making sure that uh where you're getting seed has what you want uh and then it's really just uh fertilization for example uh making sure you have all that and then just wait until the timing is right in terms of uh soil moisture temperature etc and get ready to plant we know a guy that yeah. you can get seed from yeah yeah look at mac <laughs> plantbiologic.com will help you out on some of those issues that he mentioned there for sure so bronson at this time of year you know it's like the 8th of august is there a is there a time in there when you say okay yeah you're gonna have to you, I don't i'm worried about fawns in places getting bush hogged mm-hmm. is, is there a point in time when you say okay there by now everything should be okay is there, is there a date? Well, it's I'm not talking about over the entire southeast or the range of the whitetail. Just in Mississippi, you know, we got a lot of variation in when the, the ruts are and when fawns are being dropped. So depending on where you are, there may still be fawns hitting the ground in September. Now, that's, that's going to be late, but it is certainly possible. But hopefully by end of August and beginning of September – the chances of that happening would be minimal. Yeah. Guys need to be careful. Yeah. And it's hard to see them. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's hard to see yeah, them. That's yeah. what I, can't Im- I, haven't, I can't imagine hitting one, but we work so hard to raise them. Yeah. And and I, I get excited at both ends of the spectrum. I like seeing big, old, mature, and I like seeing very, very oh, young yeah. fawns. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't know, some, something about them I get excited about. Yeah. All right, looking around uh, – Dr. Elmore, Dwayne, we really appreciate you coming on uh, very much. Bronson, appreciate you driving Anytime. over here. Mac, Richie, wake up over there. Dudley, why don't you say adios, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.